So, so we turn next then to deal with the application made by Greater Manchester Police for a variation in the Rule 10 timetable relating to Deputy Chief Constable Pilling. And can we set out um, in very short form what our position is, subject obviously to how the arguments develop? Uh, the position is that the arguments of, on the one hand, Greater Manchester Police and, on the other hand, the families have been set out with clarity and it seems to CTI, CTI that there are powerful points on both sides. The essential question is what will enable the inquiry to achieve the best evidence from DCC Pilling? And that means a situation, in our view, in which he is able to answer the questions from the witness box when they are asked, as opposed to parking answers and coming back at some later stage or responding in writing. And in our view, what is most likely to ensure that is indeed varying the timetable as has been requested, but with it being made clear to Deputy Chief Constable Pilling that that is expected to avoid a situation in which he parks. And so, so we hope that that's clear. We think that there should be a variation, but that that should result in questions being answered from the witness box. So we do understand that evidence will continue to be heard during the varied timetable and that that evidence may have an impact on what core participants wish to ask. But we would simply add that if there is a change, they should be permitted to make further submissions to you. So, so that is our position and having made that clear, we will now invite Mr Horwell, who we hope is able to join us to make his application. Good morning, sir. I, I, hope, I hope I can be seen and, and heard. You can. You're not quite synchronised at the moment, Mr Horwell, but we can cope with that. All right. Um, I, I'm grateful to Mr Greeny for setting out um, his views because they are identical to, to mine in, in this sense. All that we have sought to do is to strike a sensible balance between Mr Pilling's responsibilities to this inquiry and those which he plainly has to Greater Manchester Police. And it is our view, uh, because of the enormous volume of potential evidence that he may give, that an extension is required. I hope that it was obvious from our application that we were not in any sense seeking to take a tactical advantage. Of course, if evidence emerges between Rule 10 responses and the time at which Mr. Pilling gives evidence, of course additional matters can be ed added to the evidence proposal and additional documents then added to the proposal. And, and so I would have thought that would have been obvious for two reasons. First of all, I, I don't think that there has been a single occasion on which you have stopped a core participant adding a document to that bundle, even at a late stage, as long as the witness has had time to look at it. And secondly, Mr. Weatherby questioned Mr. Barraclough on documents that were in addition to those in the evidence proposal, and we didn't object. This is not seeking to take a tactical advantage at all. It is attempting to make the best use of Mr Pilling's time to ensure that he can give best evidence to this inquiry. Those are our motives and those are our objectives. And as I have said, in, in our view, an extension to the normal procedure is justified. And, and so we've set out our arguments in the written application. Unless there's anything further you would wish me to address you upon, um, those are our submissions. Thank you. 
And sir, I know that Mr Weatherby is taking the lead on behalf of the families in relation to this, and I'd invite him to join us by the link. Yes, can you hear me, sir? I can, yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll be very brief. Uh, we, uh, we put in written submissions, so um, I, I don't want to repeat those. Just, just in terms of Mr Barraclough, um, there was virtually no document that, that was put to Mr Barraclough that hadn't been um, um, raised in advance. There was some late disclosure, which meant that there were additions to the Rule 10, um, but it certainly wasn't our intention to put anything to Mr Barraclough that he hadn't had the opportunity to see in advance. Um, with respect to time limits, um, the time limits on Rule 10 are a practical way in which to administer that process. And they are primarily to assist the inquiry rather than the witness, although the two might be said to go hand in hand. And we don't uh, suggest that any principle arises in respect of this application, um, other than that witnesses generally should not be treated differently um, with, with regard to, to this sort of matter. Um, and also we've raised the issue of the thin end of the wedge and that Mr Hall has been good enough to indicate there will in fact be a total of four such applications from GMP as currently thought, um, MI5 another, uh, and no doubt others who will be watching um, may uh, choose to take um, a similar approach. Um, both the Greater Manchester Police and Mr Pilling have had the benefit of very detailed expert reports. Um, in short order, they know the areas and, and the questions that they have to answer. Um, I'm certainly happy to engage with Mr Horwell over, in a dialogue over uh, any particular um, issues in, well in advance of Mr Pilling's um, um, evidence. I don't speak for all of the family teams, but I, I doubt anyone would, would, would not be prepared to do similarly. Um, the practical point for us, uh, and no doubt for others, um, is that teams are preparing for witnesses in real time, as well as preparing Rule 10 applications ahead of time. Um, and the, the applications for more time are being made in respect to the bigger witnesses where more work is plainly required. In the particular circumstance of Mr Pilling, the extension sought would mean that the evidence proposal would be sent out at the start of February, and that being not long after the start of Chapter 10, and therefore before um, some of the witnesses um, who are probably going to be relevant to Mr Pilling's evidence are in fact due to be heard, uh, and therefore that in our submission creates a difficulty for the process uh, rather than um, assisting it. Mr Pilling is giving evidence very much about his own area of specialism. Um, he's already had to prepare detailed statements, no doubt reviewed the evidence of his own officers and also the expert reports. Uh, and therefore, we simply say that requiring Rule 10s so much earlier in his case will create significant difficulty for us. We're not sure how they will assist the inquiry or indeed the quality of Mr Pilling's um, um, evidence. So those are our submissions, unless there's anything we can assist further on. No, I'm grateful. Thank you very much. I've obviously, as I've said, read the submissions that you put in, very helpfully put in in writing. So thank you. So insofar as I indicated that there was a common position as between the, um, uh, the, the families, that was wrong because I know that, uh, that Mr Cooper, on behalf of his families, supports the application. So I can be sure we support the application uh, from Greater Manchester Police. We understand the reasons they're positing. We, we support the approach taken by CTI on this matter. Obviously, in due course, uh, efforts may need to be made by a number of uh, parties, maybe our own in due course, to be asking for extensions to best assist this inquiry. So we'll show that a level of goodwill at this stage uh, to assist the process uh, and support the applications by CTI. Okay. Mr. Mr Atkinson, next please. Would you like a casting vote, Mr Atkinson? I think there's someone else to come as well. Um, so we entirely support the position adopted by Mr Weatherby and support his submissions both okay. in Thank writing you. and in person. We, we share his concern that um, other organisations will adopt a similar 
approach, which would result in, in um, multiple Rule 10s for serious, for, for prominent witnesses. Uh, the inquiry for which we are grateful adopted our suggestion uh, that Chapter 10 and indeed Chapter 7 should start with those um, on, on the ground, as it were, and move up through the organisations. Uh, we, we submit it worked well with Chapter 7 to get a better understanding of, of how the operation worked. It will, we submit, have a similar benefit for Chapter 10. And, and if we are to um, draft our, our Rule 10s in relation to the senior witnesses before we have heard the juniors, it will inevitably mean having to do that twice. We submit that is not helpful to anyone, um, and we otherwise adopt Mr Weatherby's submissions. Thank you very much. And uh, I don't know if Mr Welch has anything he wishes to add. Only this. Our position is that we support Mr Weatherby's submissions. I have nothing further to add. OK. <coughs> Thank you. Well, sir, and we have uh, nothing further to add either. Right, I will, I will give a reasoned decision in writing which will be sent round to the parties. So thank you all for your um, clear and concise submissions. Thank you. And uh, obviously our arguments, good arguments on both sides. All right, thank you, sir. So we're going to turn next to address issues of timetabling. Yeah. And, sir, as you know, a detailed email was circulated to all core participants last evening, but we will summarise the position now. The starting point is to state publicly that your intention, sir, is, we know, to issue your report on a rolling basis. First, you intend to publish a report on the key evidential issues that arose during Chapter 7, which of course concerned the security arrangements at the arena, and to make recommendations. Can I just expand on the reasons for that? Of course, sir, yes. A little. Um, it's obviously better to do these things when they're reasonably fresh in one's mind. Of course, I have notes, we have a transcript. Mr Cooper, you don't need to stand up. It's very, it's very nice of you to do so, but um, this may take a little while, so please do that. Um, we have a transcript to read, and also I have my own notes, which I can read, but actually I think most would think that making decisions, giving reasoned decisions, is better the sooner it is after you've actually heard it. I am also concerned that there is all also what, what we've been doing will lead into and feed in to the question relating to Martin's Law. I am very concerned that nothing that we should do should delay any of that process rather than encourage it to get on with it and hopefully by giving um, my views and the inquiry team consideration of these matters will hopefully um, get the process going quicker rather than slow it down. So I don't want to do anything which might cause any delays along the line. And if we waited till the end of the inquiry, um, then it would substantially delay what goes on. So um, we're keen not to do that. Thank you very much indeed, sir, for that clarification. And the report on Chapter 7 uh, will be, as we'll term it, Volume 1 of your report. We know that your aim is to publish that report, and we underline the word aim, before the 22nd of May 2021, the significance of which date will be lost on absolutely no one. That is, may we say, highly ambitious, and it will require the cooperation of all core participants and, indeed, others. But nonetheless, we know, sir, that you are focused upon achieving that. To that end, the date for closing written submissions on Chapter 7 has been extended to 12pm on the 8th of January of next year, so as to enable core participants to develop their points in the light of what I have just said. Second, sir, you intend to publish a report on the emergency response to the arena attack and the experience of each of those who died, that will be volume two of the report. And third, you intend to publish a report on radicalisation and preventability, chapters 13 and 14, and that will be volume three of your report. Next, the evidence to be heard in further chapters. The inquiry legal team has undertaken a review of the timetable in light of progress to date. We predict that at current progress, 
the oral evidence hearings would run through to November of 2021, with Chapter 10 alone taking 20 weeks. And we know, sir, that your view, which we as the Inquiry Legal Team entirely share, is that that is simply too long. On the one hand, of course, you must receive the evidence that you need in order to make your findings and to make your recommendations. That, of course, is critical. But on the other hand, you need to make findings and recommendations at a stage at which they are relevant and capable of making a difference. So, in short, we need to move, if at all possible, more quickly so that your Volume 2 and 3 reports can be published as early as possible. So, what we as the Inquiry Legal Team propose to do is to issue a revised Chapter 10 timetable in the first instance with others to follow over the Christmas break. We need to be clear that this is not something that we are imposing upon core participants. So that if once they have seen the revised timetable, core participants consider that a witness that we have removed is as unnecessary or duplicative is in fact needed, they should say so and we will consider their position. So that what core participants will receive is the Chapter 10 timetable as it currently exists, but we will highlight those witnesses that we consider are no longer necessary or duplicate the evidence of other witnesses. And we can say, sir, although we say it tentatively, that the discussions that we have had so far lead us to believe that real progress can be made. And so we would invite submissions, first of all, from the families in response to what we've just said, although we have telegraphed it. Thank you. Mr Cooper. So certainly on behalf of those we represent, firstly, uh, we have had helpful conversations with Mr Green in advance of you being addressed. And as you would expect and anticipate, given conduct over the last few months, that that's been fruitful and will continue to be fruitful. Uh, and cooperation and discussion is, as we say, vital, and we are optimistic that... Uh, it will produce results for you. Having said that, sir, I would on behalf of those we represent, because we've spoken to them about, uh, in general about progress, not, not the particularity, but in general about progress. And, and, and one thing that is particularly asserted upon me to represent to you from those we represent is that if you'll excuse me for being uh, blunt about it, the families require a thorough and comprehensive assessment of all the relevant evidence. Uh, Within that context of a, an inquiry into all the relevant and a comprehensive inquiry into all the relevant evidence, I add whatever time it takes in the context of, 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 of that statement. I don't submit in whatever time it takes for matters which I will not assist you, but whatever time it takes. And although I hear from a learned friend of uh, uh, assessments and projections as to how long this inquiry will take, and we will do our best to make sure that uh, uh, that doesn't happen, if it has to happen, we will be uh, uh, submitting to you upon the relevant evidence, then it must happen. But we'll, we'll get to that uh, at, at a later stage. So we support, obviously, what my learned friend has said to you, emphasising again as strongly as I possibly can that the families have come on a long journey, and this is the end of their journey, or potentially the end of their journey, uh, and whatever it takes, however long it takes, we ask you to... Uh, allow it to take place. Thank you. And Mr Atkinson, next, please. Uh, so the families are on um, a journey that has many parts to it, some of which, sadly, they will probably never get to the end of. But it is their hope that this part of their journey will result in positive steps that can make real change, that will ensure that others don't have to suffer what they have suffered. And they recognise that the sooner that, that can be done, um, the better. Uh, and we therefore applaud, um, so your, your decision um, to issue a report in relation to Chapter 7 as soon as you have indicated, because there are, we submit, very clear things that need to be done um, and should be done as soon as that can be achieved. We, we similarly um, applaud the steps now being taken by your inquiry team to focus Chapter 10, which is at risk of um, losing it and the 
points of significance in a welter of material unless there is that focus and we will do all that we can to help that focus be achieved uh, and we will um, as further uh, proposals for later chapters come our way and we encourage that to happen um, we'll do the same for those but we um, otherwise support what's been proposed. Thank you Mr Anderson, I'm grateful. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask Mr Weatherby whether he has anything to contribute on this issue. Yes, I, thank you very much. I, I um, endorse um, just about everything that um, has already been said. Uh, may I um, again strongly um, and respectfully um, support the report being dealt with in stages. One of the problems with inquiries is sometimes that it, because of the volume of material, that it sometimes takes a very long time to produce reports by which um, justice is partially defeated because of, because of the passage of time, but also that recommendations um, are made far too long after the evidence is heard. So we strongly support that approach. May I just raise one minor detail um, on the current plan that Mr Green has outlined, um, chapters 8 and 9 seem to have been missed. So I just wonder whether some attention could be uh, paid to where they would fit into the reporting process. So Mr Weatherby, we anticipate that, that chapters 8 and 9 would be dealt with in volume 2 of the report. That's very helpful indeed. Um, just in terms of the timetable, um, we um, uh, strongly are of the view that the process should be dealt with as quickly as possible, but should, of course, take as long as necessary. Um, we, um, um, on behalf of um, families we represent, um, don't want this process to go on any longer than is necessary. It's, of course, extremely traumatic for the families, um, and therefore all of us are under an obligation um, to deal with this as quickly as possible, and therefore we will, my, my team certainly will be engaging proactively with your team to see how far we can sensibly reduce, in particular, chapters 10. There are various um, ideas that we hope to be able to add into that process. There may be areas which are not in dispute by anybody that can be um, reduced to um, lists of facts which can be agreed, for example. Uh, and there may be ways that we can cut down the amount of questioning uh, that has hitherto been deemed necessary with some of the witnesses. Thank you. Thank you. And so uh, next, I, if Mr Welch has anything he wishes to add. Very briefly, we've worked constructively with your team thus far. We'll continue to do so. And all the family teams have worked constructively together. We'll continue to do so, particularly in relation to Chapter 10, we hope, in order to cut that down as much as we can. OK, thank you. In relation to when chapters eight and nine should appear in reports, it's of course entirely a matter of user because it's your report. But um, a good many witnesses who were um, potentially either chapter eight or chapter 13 are, have for very good reason been put into chapter 13. We, we would respectfully suggest that a comprehensive view of chapter eight does need chapter 13 to have happened. But of course, that's a matter for you. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, that's a sensible suggestion which we'll reflect right. on. Thank you, Mr. Atkinson. Thank you. So we're very grateful for all of those remarks. Of course, there will be no rush. No, I am also very grateful for the remarks. Um, we have taken longer than was anticipated so far, but I think this was possibly an area of the inquiry where there's probably been more surprises than people were expecting, which has come out of the questioning which has been asked. Now, that may occur in Chapter 10 as well, but there has already been an inquiry and some detailed examination in relation to Chapter 10. There are also a lot of witnesses, or a number of witnesses, who were extremely distressed by their experience. And if they can be saved actually going through it again in the witness box, then I'm sure they would appreciate it as well. And I'm grateful for the intention to try and shorten matters as much as we can. Uh, I make it perfectly clear that it will take as long as it needs to take, although I'd quite like to have some retirement at the end of this process when it's finally finished. But of course we will take what time is actually necessary to do it, but we need to look at that. We are also learning as we go along. It does seem to me to be in a very cooperative process so far. 
Um, my case management skills may improve as we go on because not having experience of having to case manage an inquiry before, so which I hope will happen um, cooperatively as we go. Um, let's keep it as short as we can, but obviously doing everything is necessary. And thank you for the work which will, will be done about that. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, having dealt with that series of issues, we're going to turn now to uh, evidence. Uh, the starting point is for some statements to be read, and Mr Dillapore will take what he would describe as the opportunity to deal with that at this stage. Could we go to the holding screen, please? The holding screen down. Thank you. Uh, first, a brief return to Chapter 7. These are witness statements to be published on the inquiry website and therefore to be taken as read into evidence. Uh, three witness statements will be published later today. Uh, a second statement from Liz Forster, uh, CTSA from Greater Manchester Police. A second statement from John Sharkey, uh, part of the SMG Europe Limited structure, and finally a second statement from Sergeant Gareth Wilson of British Transport Police. Next, turning back to Chapter 8, uh, three witness statements, uh, or rather two witness statements and an interview to uh, be read and summarised. Uh, the first is from Relative C. For those who are following uh, INQ 030675 is the basis of what I'm about to put into evidence. Uh, can I make this clear that, as we've told core participants, uh, that all three of these witnesses provide uh, substantial evidence relevant to Chapter 13, radicalisation, and so this is uh, not to be taken as the last that we will hear from these witnesses. Uh, however, at this stage, they do have relevant evidence to give in relation to planning and preparation. So, relative C first, he says of uh, Salman Abedi that in his teenage years, he was, quote, a rough kind of guy, smoking cannabis, he would be violent, getting into fights, uh, kind of a bit like a gangster lifestyle. He goes on to say he grew up a bit, he became happier, more knowledgeable, and he was always smiling. About a year ago, he says, uh, indicate, and his statement is dated 2017, Salman started becoming religious. My mum's view was that his religious views were too strong and she told us not to listen to him. My mum would confront Salman about his religious views and sometimes resulted in conflict between them. He goes on to say, on the 2nd of March 2017, Hashim I'm came so sorry to interrupt, Madam. I'm trying to follow, and I understand it's being praised. It. I'm trying to follow the state with his mother friend goes along, and I know he's taken certain sections from it. If he could just assist me when he's moving paragraphs as to what page he's going to, please. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I can. I followed the first block, but then well, he left somewhere uh, else, and I lost myself. Yes. Well, I've, uh, Sarah, as you will appreciate, I've prepared um, an extract from the statement, oh. um, and so I had not prepared to move back and forth, but if you will give me a moment, I will seek to assist. It's going to delay matters. I, I, I won't press it. Well, it may be that you could be sent... I, I'm very happy to provide my own friend what I've prepared for this, and uh, I will take right? him to, to where I haven't. Okay. As I say, um, and I hope I made clear, this is not the last we'll be hearing from these witnesses, so if no. there are parts which are omitted, uh, Chapter 13 will provide an opportunity to return okay. to them. But the but focus you is... on what you've... Quite how so. you've got, what you're reading. Quite so, sir. I'm grateful, thank you. On the 2nd of March, uh, Relative C says, Hashem came to my house and we were sitting in the sofa room. We had been chatting for a while and then Hashem asked me if I had an Amazon account. I told him that I did and he asked me if I would order something for him. He said he needed some sulfuric acid for his car. I don't have much knowledge about cars and how they work, so I had no cause to question Hashem about why he needed acid. I went and got my laptop from my room and loaded up my Amazon account. I recall that we did a Google search first and then Amazon came up. Hashim looked through the various adverts and picked out the one he wanted to buy. He asked me to pay the money, which came to a total of £69.36, including the postage, and he gave me the cash there and then. 
He did not give me the full amount because I already owed him £20 from when he helped me get a tyre for my mum's car. Again, I didn't think this purchase was anything out of the ordinary, and I hardly gave it another thought. I have no recollection of the person or company that was selling the acid, but I have been shown a summary of my Amazon purchases and my bank account, and I agree the acid was purchased from Italy. A few days later, I can't recall the precise day, there was a card from a delivery company at our house. The card stated that a parcel had been left at a neighbour's house, which was opposite ours. I went to the neighbour and collected the parcel. I knew the parcel was for Hashim. It was in a box and it was quite big and pretty heavy. I don't know the weight or quantity, but I accept the order was for five litres of sulfuric acid. Having collected the parcel from the neighbour, I took it directly to Hashim's house. I knocked at their house, but nobody was at home. I took the parcel back to my house and I put it on the stairs. I don't know who collected it, but, and here I'm using the cipher, trial witness 2 must have given it to whoever came for it as nobody else was staying at our house at the time. Sometime later, I asked trial witness 2 if Salman had come to collect the parcel and he said yes. This doesn't confirm that Salman actually collected it as it could have been Hashim. We routinely just refer to Salman and Hashim as Salman collectively. And all I can say is that I confirmed with trial witness 2 that they had collected the parcel. I felt slightly embarrassed about them having to come for it, as I felt, though, the courteous thing to do was to take it to them. I didn't want them to think that I couldn't be bothered to take it to them. On the occasions I had cause to visit Salman and Hashim at their house, I do not recall seeing or hearing anything out of the ordinary, and there was nothing that caused me a particular concern. I am aware that Salman had developed strong religious views. He never really tried to impress his views upon me, but I think he might have tried to discuss them with my brother, and he may have mentioned jihad to him. Me and my mum always told trial witness too <coughs> that Salman's interpretation of Islam was too strict and that he should not pay attention to him. <coughs> Next, I'm going to... Right, just before you go on, so, yes. did relative C give evidence at the trial of Hashim Abedi? Uh, if you would just bear with me one moment, please, sir. I think the answer to that question is yes, but I will confirm it now. And I just wonder whether his evidence was read or whether it was given orally. So his evidence was read. Thank you. <coughs> uh, the next witness, trial witness three, did give live evidence at the trial, sir. Thank you. Uh, he provided information to the police by means of a, a video interview, uh, the transcript of which runs to some 90 pages. It appears under INQ 030100. Um, I propose to provide a very, very short summary of that. Um, there is considerable detail relevant to radicalisation, and we will liaise with the core participants about that for the purpose of Chapter 13, uh, it includes the fact that Salman Abedi, according to Trial Witness 3, said that studying chemistry uh, would mean that he, Trial Witness 3, would be able to build a bomb, albeit that he thought that Salman Abedi was joking when he said that. Uh, all, all I need to say is that he includes within that interview the fact that he was aware of a parcel being uh, delivered to a neighbour. He indicates it was Hashem who collected it and that Hashem said it was car oil in the parcel. Finally, trial witness four, and so I can help you in answer to your question that he was called as a live witness in the trial, <coughs> INQ 030688. I'm going to pick it up partway through the statement. I have been asked by officers if I have bought anything at the request of Hashem or Salman Abedi or being asked to purchase anything on their behalf. He, he goes on to state that he left the UK on the 4th of January 2017, which provides a reference date for when this conversation happened. He goes on to say, and I quote, I think it was January 2017 that Hashem Abedi asked me to purchase a product for his car. I think it was a liquid, possibly something for the battery. He asked me if I'd have the product delivered to an Amazon locker, which is a delivery option used by Amazon to have a product sent to an agreed location. He goes on to say that he was working abroad at the time of the request, hence the relevance of the 4th of January. 
picking the statement up again, I refused Hashem's request and I told him to get the product himself and did not receive any further requests. He goes on to say that he was present when a conversation took place over the telephone between his boss and Hashem Abedi, uh, that conversation being on speakerphone so that he could hear what was being said. And he says that the same request was made of his boss and that his boss also said no. He concludes by stating, and I quote, I found this a very strange request in that I was being asked to buy something that was readily available to the general public. So that concludes the reading today. Uh, I shall endeavour to give Mr Cooper every assistance in terms of uh, where from those statements uh, that information was taken. Uh, can I indicate also uh, that a significant number of further statements will be published on the inquiry website later today relevant to planning and preparation. I don't read out the list. The core participants have that list already and indeed we have provided to representatives of the press a provisional copy of that list so they know what to expect. Thank you. If this is my learned friend, I managed to catch up. He's got lots of work to do. I won't <laughs> okay. press him on that. Uh, I, I've managed to catch up. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much, much indeed, Mr Keeper. Um, so it's now just after 11 o'clock. We understand that our next witness is uh, arriving in the building about half past 11. Um, we acknowledge that he was originally scheduled for later in the day and so has made arrangements to assist us by coming this morning. I'm not exactly sure when we will be able to start, but I anticipate it won't be before quarter two, as he'll need to be spoken to once he's arrived. Uh, right. This is not a very long witness, as I understand it. Not. Um, so once we started, I will intend to go on until we've finished, because that will be the end of our hearings um, up until Christmas. And so um, I hope we finish that in reasonable time um, so that uh, we can all finish for the day. So our expectation, Ms Cartwright will be dealing with the witness, is that uh, he will take approximately half an hour, including questions from the families. I, th I think I'm probably being told that's slightly optimistic, but we <laughs> we'll see how we go. We have encouraged you, sir, Mr De Francesco is taking the questioning, so we might yet achieve that. No reason to think he's any quicker than you are. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, sir. The gentleman in the witness box is Mr Ballam. Could I ask that he now be sworn, please? Could you just stand up for a minute, Mr Ballam, to be sworn? Could you just stand up for a minute to be sworn? Yeah. Oh, thank you. And then you can sit down after that. OK, just check it's the Quran and then put it back in there. Thank you. If anyone's wondering, this is actually the normal procedure which should be carried out when swearing on the Quran. Thank you. Not to put the hands on. Yes, do, please. Thank you. Okay. If um, you just repeat the <coughs> words after me. I swear by Allah. I swear by Allah. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Should be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing. And nothing. But. But. The truth. The truth. Thank you. No Thank you. Please take a seat. Uh, and thank you very much for coming earlier. I know that you were due to come at two o'clock, so it's helped us a lot by you coming earlier. So thank you for that. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Ballam. Mr. Ballam, there should be in the bundle in front of you a copy of your witness statement yes. dated the 12th of June of 2017. Have you had an opportunity to refresh your memory from that witness statement? Yes, I did. And are the contents of it true to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes. Now, I want to ask you, first of all, you tell us in that statement that you were employed at a fast food traders in Trafford as a manager. Are you still employed at that company? I own the company now. Okay. 
And I, the reason why I start asking you that, because you're going to assist us today with your relationship with a gentleman by the name of Ahmed Tagdi. And I think it's right to say that that was a business that was previously owned by Mr Tagdi's father, is that correct? Yes. And you tell us in the witness statement that um, Mr Tagdi's father uh, was killed in uh, Libya in 2011, is that correct? Yes. And, and I think March? 2nd of March. And would it be fair to say that you had a close relationship with the Tagdi family? Yes, I do. You also describe yourself in respect of your relationship with Ahmed Tagdi, I think who was Mr Tagdi's eldest son, as performing a father figure role for him? Not fully, but I try to support as much as I can, but you will never be able to reach this level, no. even if I would like to. And I think you tell us in the witness statement that as of the time of the arena attack, you'd known Ahmed Tagdi for about 20 years. Pretty much, yeah. And that as well as visiting the family home, you also, I think, worked with Ahmed Tagdi because he'd also work at the company where you were manager at the time. Yes. And just to perhaps get a little bit more detail about the relationship you had with Ahmed Tagdi, I think you assisted him with a car for when he was studying at university. Yes. And you would seek to give him advice generally about how best to support him, almost like a father would do. To Ahmed and anyone else in the community or ask me for advice, they do the same. Mr. Ballon, could I just ask you to move your chair slightly further forward? Um, that's I'm sorry. absolutely fine. No, no, it's, it's fine. Thank you. No problem. Please don't worry. Now, I want to ask you, please, about a matter that occurred after the arena attack on the 22nd of May of 2017. And you tell us in your witness statement that you became aware of the arena attack the day after, on the 23rd of May. Yeah. yeah. And I think you also indicate that you knew the person who, at that stage, was suspected of carrying out the attack, one Salman Abedi. <coughs> yeah. And is it right that you also had some knowledge of Salman Abedi's wider family? I know his older brother and his father. The young one, I don't know him much, but I know that I, I see him as well, but yeah. And I think, so the older, older brother being Ishmael Abedi. Yeah. And I think you tell us in respect of uh, the father that you didn't know him by the name of Ramadan Abedi. How did you know uh, Salman Abedi's father's name? What, what was your understanding of his, his name that he went by? I don't understand the question. Sorry, I do apologise. I think you tell us in your witness statement that you knew Salman Abedi's father by the name Abu Ishmael. Abu Ismail, yeah. Thank you. And could you just tell us, I think you say that you knew them from attending the same mosque. Yeah. And could you just confirm which mosque that was, please? It's Desbury Mosque. Now, I wonder if you could assist us, please, with a conversation that you had with uh, Ahmed Tagdi about knowledge and information he had that was relevant to uh, the attack and the involvement of Salman Abedi. Do you recall having a conversation with Ahmed Tagdi? Again, if you can ask you to repeat the question, please. So you tell us in your witness statement, and I think you give... a. a an understanding that the date of this conversation was the 26th of May of 2017. Mm -hmm. And you link it to Ahmed Tagdi speaking to you because the press were pestering him. All right. Do you recall that? Yes. And so what I would ask you to do, please, is just tell us what the conversation was that you had, please, with Ahmed Tagdi. Truly, I don't remember the whole conversation, and it was time ago now. Of course. But... Uh, I remember because I left, uh, from 2009 up to 2014, I was not in UK, I was in Libya. And I came back to UK in 2014. And in that time, I didn't see Ahmed or the family, and they lost their father in 2011. So there is a gap, I didn't see the family on that gap. However, when I come, in the UK, I was busy with my own children and everything, so I wasn't looking at the family or doing what I'm supposed to do to support or check on the kids. Then I, I see the family were not in a very good state because they were a teenager, so this age was always fighting and problems. So 
Ahmed was the oldest, so I was speaking with him and I tried to support him. And in our culture, if a young man not studying or not working, that means he will not do well. So, but never in my mind comes this type of not well, though. It is unwell in a way of teenagers smoking or doing something bad. However, so I told him, either you work or you study, and I will support either of them, but do not just stay like this and say I'm doing good. And he enrolled in university and successfully did, so I said, okay, that means I should be supporting more. And it was winter and it was dark, so I see him going, and I didn't want him to, to leave the university. So that's why I offer him to buy him 600 pound, I believe. I'm not, I'm not very sure about the price, but it was 600, I think. And I told him, you will work, do some things like making orders, contacting post office. So I tried to give him to pay for the car so I could fill his full time. From that respect, when he comes asking about the arena, or he said to me, there is media calling me, or I have been asked to give interview. I said to him, what do you do with this? Do you know the guy? We all know because he's Libyan, but I said, do you know him very well? Like, So he said to me, I know him. So I said to him, but if you go through the press, you will not do your exams, because there were exams or tasks to do in the university. So I said, you need to pay attention to your study and not go to, to this type of information because you will waste time and that will be a hustle. Plus the whole community being affected by this matter. So there was a mess anyway. So I tried to reduce the amount of problems and make him focus on his study. In his study. And that's what the conversation was about. And, and so what you've just described to us was that Ahmed Tagdi was asking you advice about whether you should speak to the media? He wasn't asking for advice. He's, I, it was, I don't know how the conversation came, but he was telling me that the media was contacting him, they speak to him, he has speak with him, but there was not advice in a way of advice. So I would say, why would you bother about going to interviews? Just do your exams and don't go to the media. And can I ask you then, did Ahmed Tagdi tell you the information he had that would have been of interest to the media at that time? I never think it would be, to be honest with you. And I think you referenced that it was a man by the name of Akram Ramadan that had given uh, Ahmed Tagdi's name to the press, and that's why they were contacting him. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't remember the name. If you ask me what the name now, I wouldn't say, but yes, that was written and... Yeah. But just, I think that's the name I think you gave in the witness statement yeah, yeah. you provided. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I remember the, but it is, yeah, that's the name he said. And, and is that a, um, a man that you knew? Not very much in a way, like, I wouldn't, because I know the family, and I don't know which one of the family he is. Okay. But we, we, the inquiry has some knowledge that it was a man by that name who gave an interview to the BBC Panorama interview. Oh that was broadcast on the 29th of May. Are you able to help us as to whether that's the same gentleman? Can you say again, please? The, the inquiry aware of a, a man by the name of Akram Ramadan, who gave a media interview to the BBC as part of the panorama uh, that was broadcast on the 29th of May of 2017. Do you know that that's the same man that you've told us about in the statement? No, I don't, I don't understand. What's the connections? It's the same man, the same name with... Yeah, so you've given us the name of um, Akram ben Ramadan that was uh, given the name of Ahmed Tagdi to the media, and we're aware of a man that gave an interview to the I BBC understand. panel. I understand. No, I don't, I don't, don't see the programme in okay. the interview, sorry. Thank you. So can, can I ask you then, did Ahmed Tagdi give you further information at that time about things he did know about Salman Abedi? No. Did he tell you anything about his involvement in purchasing a Nissan car with Salman Abedi on the 13th of April of 2017, before you went to Libya? No. Did he tell you anything about knowing where the Nissan car was stored at Deval House? We did not have any conversation about any other cars or any connections with, uh, with Salman Abedi, no. And I just want to complete it because I'm going to ask you about a telephone uh, that you took possession of for a while. So I want to also ask you, did uh, Ahmed Tagdi tell you anything about telephone calls that he'd made to Salman Abedi whilst he had been back home in Libya between April and May of 2017? No. And did Ahmed Tagdi tell you anything about the fact that he had been to visit the Nissan uh, car on the 23rd of May of 2017? 
at Jabal House? No. So he gave you none of that information? No, I just know it now. Can I ask you, was there any conversation at that time with Ahmed Tagdi about whether he should be contacting the police? Seriously, no. There is nothing to do with... I, didn't, I don't have any knowledge of any communications or any, any, any connections between Ahmed Tagdi and Salman. Mr Balam, we would hope that your evidence would come after Mr Tagdi's, but that's not been possible. Uh, but one of the things that Ahmed Tagdi's witness statement tells us about is he indicates that I did not contact the police after the bombing to tell them what I knew about Sam Nabedi, as I was advised uh, not to by you. Oh. No, seriously. I mean... No. So you say that would be in inaccurate? Of course. Yeah. Can you repeat that, please? So within a witness statement, it, it is indicated, and again, we've not heard the live evidence yet of Mr Tagdi, that he did not contact the police after the bombing to tell them what he knew about Salman Abedi, as advised, he was advised not to by yourself. No. <coughs> Could I ask you then about the mobile phone when you're having the discussion? How was it that you came to take possession of Mr Tagdi's iPhone 7, please? And that same day when we had the conversations, I really tried my best to keep him studying and doing his work. So I said, how the media contacts you? I tried to make him avoid contacting the media. So I said, how are they contacting you? Is it by coming to your home or is it by the phone? And I said to him, just give me the phone and go and buy another phone. And this time of the year, just focus on your study and don't waste the time of uh, finishing your tasks. And I take the phone off him, switch it off, and I put it in my bag. And again, just for completeness, had Mr. Ahmed Tagdi told you anything that one of the last conversations he'd had with Salman Abedi whilst Mr. Abedi was in Libya was to delete uh, his number and all the old chat that had passed between Salman Abedi and Ahmed Tagdi? Did he give you any of that information? Ahmed never indicate any connections between him and Salman. As far as I aware, there is no real friendship or any kind of communication between both of them. That's what's my knowledge, but I'm, I'm surprised to hear what you are telling me now. OK. And I think you tell us and we're aware that on the 28th of May of 2017, Ahmed Tagdi was arrested and was in police custody. On the 28th of May of 2017, yeah. Ahmed Tagdi at that stage had been arrested. Yeah. And just by way of chronology, I think the police don't in fact then recover the Nissan vehicle until the 2nd of June of 2017. But I think you then become aware again of the police because they come to search the premises where you were a manager over the 8th and the 9th of June of 2017. Is that correct? I mean, the search part is correct, but... <laughs> It's quite a long sentence. Can you repeat again? Um, of course. Please. And so, whilst Mr Tagdi was in police custody, the counter-terrorist police came and searched the yes, premises the, yeah. where you were the manager of. Yeah, yes. I dealt with this search, yes. I assessed and I opened the doors. And, and can I ask you then, when the counter-terrorist police came to do the search, it was linked to the fact that Mr Tagdi was in police custody, wasn't it? I believe so, yes. And can I ask then why you didn't, during that police search, indicate that you had uh, knowledge and possession of one of Mr Ahmed Tagdi's mobile phones? I, I don't know if the phone was with me in that time or not, because I returned the phone to the families once Ahmed was arrested. And I'm not sure what date was the return of the phone. That's one. And the day the police came and uh, searched the premises, they closed their business for two days. I had to do a lot of business, uh, work to, to make sure that our deliveries changed dates and everything. So I was really busy dealing with the closer of the two days. It's a very busy place, and I was not, uh, didn't pay attention. I was dealing with it. But I think then, just to complete your involvement, in fact, it was the police then that specifically came to you on the 10th of June asking you for the telephone. And it was only at that stage that you provided the information as to where the phone was and then provided that, uh, sought that to be provided to the police. I mean, when you ask me a question, I answer. So it was, yeah, they asked me the question, where is the phone? I said the phone is with 
that this family, they asked me to call them and confirm that. I called them and they said yes with me and I went with the police and we collect the phone and we give it to them. Thank you. Mr Balam, that completes my questions, but there are some other questions for you. And so the indication is that the questions for the family will be taken by Mr Di Francesco. Thank you. Mr Balam, you, in answers to, to the questions that you've just been asked, um, you said that you would advise Ahmed in the same way you would advise anyone else. Yes, I believe so. But, but it's right, isn't it, that there was a particularly close relationship between the two of you? Of course. That he worked for you? Mm -hmm. That you had bought him a car in order for him to advance his studies? What was the last one? You'd bought him a car so that he could continue with his studies? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You'd had a close relationship with him and his family since he was five years old? Yes, I do. And as you said, you tried to guide him and encourage him to live a good life? When he came to you on the 26th and said that he was being contacted by the media about his friendship with Salman Abedi, did you ask him whether he was involved in events surrounding the 22nd of May 2017? I don't recall asking him on this question for me. I would, I would never come in my mind that he's involved. I'm really shocked that he's in contact with him, so I I didn't ask the question. I don't remember asking him this question directly, like... Well, you told the police that Ahmed had said to you that the media were getting in touch because Salman was his friend. Correct? Because he knows Salman, because not his friend. He didn't say it. In... Well, him and Salman have been friends for a very long time. They... See, the Libyan community, all these children, they grow together. Not, I, I don't see Ahmed relation as a special with the... I didn't know all this now. I know it now, but... Back then, I was in my mind that all of them, they grow together and grow, grow up together and they know each other. It well, doesn't matter. The, I didn't know the, who's deep and who's not deep. So. Well, you said in answers to previous questions that obviously the 22nd of May had had a big impact on the community. Yes, it did. There must have been significant concern that a member of the community had been involved in that attack. I People were worried, weren't they? We were all surprised that this uh, Salman was involved and never come in my mind in anyone. We were worried because of the action of the police. We were not worried about someone will go because the police action was that the mass, not uh, but the worry about the people to, because the pain being door broken and people coming out of their houses. So we were dealing with this mess and that's what we were. The community was in a problem, not because we worried that we are involved or someone involved. But you didn't ask any questions of Ahmed? I don't remember asking him, no. Um, you mentioned during the course of your evidence about him and teenagers generally being involved in fighting and problems. Can you be a bit more specific about the types of problems that you were concerned Ahmed was involved in? I mean, we live in Manchester, I'm 16, I'm 20. Anyone above 15 years old in this environment if you don't work very hard in early stage you will be worried about your so this is some worries it's a, it's a teenager not something in this scale we never worry about it in this scale did you know any of the friends and acquaintances the people who ahmed was spending time with during this period Trust me, even my son is 16 years old. I don't know. I try my best, but he don't know their phones and everything. Now, even I take the phone, I never open it, and I never take his password of it. So there is, there is a gap. So I don't know any of his friends or where he hung out with. You told um, the chairman that you, were, you had attended and were attending the Didsbury Mosque. I go to mosques. Yes. Sometime. That you knew Ramadan Abedi, but only as a consequence of him being the father of Ishmael? I mean, as a name, not as I know him because he's the father of Ishmael. No, as a name, we know him we, because, again, Arabic call, they use it as a second, like a nickname, kind of. So we'll, instead of saying, what was his name, Ramadan, they will say Abu Ismail, which is the father of Ismail. That's a name, but not, not a... Just to know him because he, he's because of his son. No. Had you ever spoken directly to him? Yeah, on lots of occasions. Yeah. Had you ever spoken directly to his son, Ishmael? 
Yeah, I, I mean, I've, I've, I'm not sure if I spoke with all of them, perhaps, because they, we see them in the mosque or in the Eid or Friday prayer, so there is time you see them. Spoken directly to Salman Abedi? Seriously, I wouldn't say no, yes, because perhaps maybe I meet him in the mosque, say hello, anyone, and not speaking as he speaks, we say hello, how are you, how are you doing, and we just go, if, if, the, if they were. But I don't recall it, I wouldn't say... If I didn't swear the Quran, I will say no, but I swear, I will say I don't know exactly if I spoke with him or not. But if I spoke with him, it will be, hello, how are you, and that's it. Well, we know now that there were people who were frequenting, going to the Didsbury Mosque, who had extreme views. We've seen, yes, perhaps. Did you have any experience in your interactions and conversations of people with extreme views? No, no. We don't, I don't make conversation in the mosque. I go pray and then I go home. And if people in the way in and out say hello, hello, and just we go, I don't stay and I don't have time to stay. Did you know of people, individuals, attending the Ditsbury Mosque who were veterans of conflict in Libya, who had fought in Libya and <clears throat> come, to the, come back to the UK? I mean, can you ask again, please? I don't understand the question. The, the people that you were interacting with. What interacting mean? Just please? talking to at the Ditsbury Mosque mm -hmm. and in the community more generally. You've said that, you've told us that there was no particular exposure to extremism. You said you had, didn't hear anything in relation to extremist views. Did you hear anything about the conflict in Libya? See, I, I go to the mosque once every six, eight months. Minimum, like, I don't go to the mosque regularly. And if I go, I will go to Friday prayer, which is normally it's a busy prayer. Since the corona, all this year, I didn't go to mosque at all, since the beginning of the year, I think. So this is like, now we're 12 months, I haven't been to the mosque, for example. If I go, will be Ramadan, my next visit, hopefully, if it is not corona. And if I go, I wouldn't, seriously, I will, because the people, I don't know them, even I don't like shaking hands. I just pray my prayer and just go on my car and go home. I don't do what you are asking me. What, um, I don't have conversations with people and who are they and they. There's many nationalities and many colors and many, you don't know them. I don't know how you maybe think people come and I don't. Okay, I thought we get the picture. Yeah, <laughs> because I just don't understand why the question is just getting uh, no, no, I, went, I, I was leaving you to complete your answer and I have no more questions for you, Mr. Okay. Khan. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I don't understand that any other representatives have questions for Mr. Ballam. No. So do you? No, thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ballam. Thank you very much indeed for coming, Mr. Ballam. No You're problem. free to go. So thank, thank you very you. much. Uh, could I ask them, whilst Mr. Ballam leaves the witness box, uh, could we just go to the holding screen? Yeah. Because Mr. Green is going to address you, yeah. please, sir. Okay. Screen. So to say that I'm going to address you is probably to overstate the position. I was simply going to indicate that that is as far as we can take the evidence today and indeed is as far as we can take the evidence this year. Thank you, Mr Greeny. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for all the hard work that's gone on since September in keeping this inquiry going in the way it has. You worked very long hours and that's not just here. It's working in preparation for the hearings, so I'm grateful for that. Uh, we've had to listen to some very difficult evidence since the inquiry started at the beginning of September. If it has been difficult for us, it has been incomparably more difficult for the bereaved families and the survivors. The Christmas period will, I hope, give them some respite from the ordeal that they are going through. All of us who have heard the tragic stories that we have heard have been convinced of, if we needed convincing of, the need for everyone to do everything they properly can 
to remove or minimise the threat from terrorism. Thank, thank you to all of you who have sent me and the rest of the team Christmas greetings. So thank you for that. And I wish you all a healthy, peaceful and restful Christmas. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We'll stand.